How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvarez here on Wrestling Observer Live. We are here every day, Monday through Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, Sunday, 3 Pacific, 6 Eastern, Saturday mornings with Jim Valley, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 Eastern, Sundays with Andrew Zarian, and it is Thursday here on the show, and you know what that means? We got a lot to talk about, more than usual, actually, because, of course, last night was AEW Dynamite, and also Rampage. We had both shows back-to-back, and uh, man, three hours, that's a long time for any show. So uh, we're going to talk about that here on the program. And uh, the highs and lows and everything else. We also got SmackDown coming up tomorrow, and uh, lineups for a bunch of shows, including the upcoming New Japan Sakura Genesis show. I watched the finals of the New Japan Cup. So we can talk about what will be the main event of that show and also that match as well. Got some ratings notes on NXT and also Raw Monday. And uh, and Ronda Rousey. Ronda's got a new book coming out. She had her first book, My Fight, Your Fight. It's a New York Times bestseller. And uh, now she's got Our Fight, which is going to talk a lot about WWE. And boy, did she not have good things to say about WWE, particularly... John Laurinaitis, and Bruce Pritchard. And she has been going all in on Bruce Pritchard for for quite a while now. And uh, we'll talk about what she had to say. we got a lot of time today for uh, your text messages, 425-780-7566. That is 425-780-7566. can try and get into some of those today. F4WOnline at gmail.com. F4W Online on Threads, Instagram, and Cameo. At Brian Alvarez on Twitter, otherwise known as X. Back in a moment with more Observer Live.
Okay, the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. You know what I want to start with today? What's that? Before you even say anything, I want to say something. All right. So Dave and I had a big argument last night, shorter than usual, actually, regarding BCC and the tag team title tournament. And I just want to make something clear here, okay? And that is that I don't care if they're in the tournament. It's not like affecting my life, okay? But the reason that I keep bringing it up is because this whole thing, there's actually a larger issue here than BCC not being in the tag team tournament. And the larger issue is one of the things that drives me nuts about AEW. It's one of the things that bothers me the most. And it really makes me angry because I know Tony knows better, okay? And that is this. If you don't want to beat the BCC in the tag team tournament, okay? If you don't want them to lose in the tournament or whatever reason you have for them not being in the tournament, I don't care, but... Give us a reason for it. That's it, okay? Let's say, I don't know why John Moxley isn't on TV. What's funny is everybody in the internet has been telling me why, and they all have a different reason for it, because they've all made up an explanation in their heads. But the fact of the matter is, we don't have any idea why he hasn't been on TV for three weeks. None whatsoever. That is the issue. The issue is, you did a pay-per-view... You did BCC versus FTR. BCC didn't just beat them, but they did a double submission finish over FTR. The moment the match is over, everyone watching thought the exact same thing. Well, they must be next in line for a tag title shot. Okay? Decisive, beat them, double submission, no interference. You could not have put them over stronger, okay? Then Sting and Darby win. And when the show's over, we all think, well, you know, I guess they're probably going to do a tournament and, you know, probably BCC and FTR maybe in the finals is what I thought. Whatever you think, whatever. They announce a tournament and they put up the graphics and there's no BCC. But FTR is in the tournament, okay? All you had to do, all you had to do was say BCC and FTR had a hard-fought battle at the pay-per-view. And while BCC was victorious, John Moxley suffered a stinger, and he will not be medically cleared for a while. That's all you have to do. But they couldn't even do that. Instead, do you want to know what has happened? What's that? John Moxley has vanished. Do you know why I bring up Britt Baker all the time? Why? It's the same thing. One day, she just vanished. And fans do the whole thing, oh, well, she's hurt. Bro, she had a broken wrist for like five months. She wrestled in a cast. She had a bad back for like oh, well over a year. They had that show where she's getting injections in her back. That's not why she's gone. I'm sure that she probably was hurt. But you know what this is? I'll give you uh, John Moxley, multi-time AEW champion. One of the biggest stars in the company, okay? Britt Baker, when she was in her prime, was the top women's star in AEW by far. And uh, one of the top stars overall in the company, okay? Let's make a comparison to WWE, all right? All right. Let's imagine that, like, Becky Lynch just vanished, Okay. She maybe she got a big win. Uh, just say like this past. Let's say they, let's say that they hadn't announced WrestleMania yet, and she beat Nia Jax in a last woman standing match on Raw, and then she vanished. Okay, a new ambassador to Ireland. They didn't tell us where she went. They didn't shoot an angle. She just was gone, and they never told us anything. Poof. For a Moxley comparison, remember when Seth Rollins did that moonsault and he injured his knee? Yes. He went on and won the match. Let's just say that after that, he just disappeared. They didn't tell you that he had a knee injury. 
They didn't tell, they didn't shoot an angle, nothing. He was just gone. Well, that's what happened to Britt Baker. One day, she suddenly was gone. John Moxley and Claudio Castagnoli destroyed FTR, double submission on a pay-per-view, and then he vanished. Gone. Now, I know Tony knows to write people off because he did it with Darby. And the funny thing is Darby actually broke his foot, so it was a very effective write-off. But, like, he's done this before, but in other cases, and this happens, it's not just Britt Baker and, and John Moxley. Like, this has happened many times. All of a sudden, someone's just gone. And the thing was, let's think back to, uh, you know, that, that whole thing with CM Punk and the Young Bucks and Brawl Out and Kenny Omega. One day they just were gone. And the weird thing about that is, okay, legal issue, whatever. But, like, when people asked, you know, what's going on at press conferences, Tony wouldn't even say, it's a legal issue I can't discuss. He just wouldn't say anything. If you're a fan that, for some reason, didn't know what was going on, one day you're watching AEW, and the next thing you know, CM Punk is gone. Never referenced. The Young Bucks are gone. Never referenced. Kenny Omega's gone. Never referenced. Where's Miro? That's another one. That's another one. Miro vanished. He was in the middle of that thing with his wife every week, and one day he vanished. And in none of these cases did they just give anything resembling... Like, listen... I know that you have a smart audience, and I know that you want to treat your audience like they're, they're you know, intelligent. That's all fine and good, but it's also professional wrestling. And all you do throughout the entire show is make up stories. You make up stories for everybody. Just make something up. Just say John Moxley suffered a stinger. Say John Moxley's trick knee is act. I don't care. Just say something. If they would have just said something, I wouldn't still be talking about this. Wondering why in God's name, are, and Dave and I wouldn't be arguing about how it's good business for them not to be in the pay-per-view because they could do something later or whatever. Like, just tell us why he's not there. And no, the answer, by the way, is not that he fell off the wagon. There's nothing wrong oh, with what? John Moxley. What? Well, that's what someone in the chat said. Oh, come crap. on. Listen, oh, no. there's nothing wrong with John Moxley. He's just... Not being used right now. He's still booked for Windy City Riot. He's still going to be doing his upcoming dates. So, make something up. Just tell me something. Tell the fans something. So then when they watch the show and they get invested in a character, the character just doesn't disappear. And, like, they're gone. Gone. So, anyway, that's why I keep bringing it up. Just tell us something. That's it. Well, you pulled that back to a much larger issue that I'm glad you went ahead and addressed. I'll take it back to the smaller issue, which was you just did not dot I's and cross T's. After you came up with the idea for the tag title tournament, you go back to a backstage promo where Moxley just goes, you know what, I got to get ready for... Naito coming up at Windy City. Fine. Got some things going on. And that's what you Anything. do now. I will say this. Your theory that you can't beat the Blackpool Combat Club doesn't hold any weight other than this. Because Claudio can get beat. It does not hurt Moxley yes. at all. Doesn't. But what it does do, if you're doing the Blackpool Combat Club against House of Torture, I guess in that case you wouldn't want to have Claudio lose. But again, all you had to do was connect that line. And that's what Dave forgot to say last night to you. It is booking. That's all they had to say. And even if you, if they didn't even have to say this, but you throw in, hey, and by the way, whoever wins that tournament, like any title here in AEW, it's going to be ours again. So you can do FTR in the Bucks or whatever with that, and then you can still have FTR and BCC later. That Just drawing that line, that's all you had to do. Back in a moment, Observer Live.
um, scrolling Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it, they're saying this was the match of the year. He was the catch. How are you feeling? Your first official match at AGW. They're already calling it match of the year. How are you feeling? I mean, I've got a lot to top now, haven't I? Like, I mean, look, once again, like, I, I can't do those type of matches without a great, like, partner to do it with. Takeshita is every bit as good as Will Ospreay. It's just on that night, I was just better, pure and simple. But, like, look at the move that I had to put him away with. Uh, the Tiger Driver, and I keep saying this so much, man. The Tiger Driver 91 is the most dangerous move in wrestling. It is not, it, it was used back in the day by Mr. Haru Masawa. And I said that right, didn't I? I'm yeah. sure I did. But, like, <laughs> I actually forgot that wrong, didn't I? Like, no! <laughs> But like it was one of the most dangerous moves in wrestling. And like some guys like some guys are able to like kind of figure out a way of getting out of it. But like it's a complete pressure on your neck, man. It's just a, it's a sheer drop. Like I, I wouldn't be surprised in like the five months time, like people will be like, hey, you can't do that move anymore. But just like this is what I bring to the table, man. Like I'm one of the most dangerous professional wrestlers in the world. Look, I am a lovely man. I, I will walk your mum across the street any day of the week. I will happily. Give you a cuddle if you're ever feeling sad. I'm always a good shoulder to cry on, and I look after you to the day I die. But I am one mean motherfucker when I want to be. Cool. Like that's all I care about, man. So like, if this is so, this is the first pay per view of AEW's year for 2024, right? So we got Dynasty, but we got Forbidden Door. We've got uh, Double all Nothing, in, Double Nothing, All In, All Out, uh, Full Gear, no, Wrestle Dream, Full Gear, and World's End. Yeah, yeah. That's the first yeah. one. <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. Like I said, the most dangerous man in wrestling right now, bro. Yes, sir. On uh, D Dowdy, uh, 104.5 FM, WCCG. I uh, will. Question for you um, throughout the match, there were a lot of aha moments, a lot of momentum shifting. How were you able to stay focused and adapt to, to catch this offense? Uh, a lot of it has just been like. Uh, experience over in Japan, dude. Like, I mean, once again, I, I have watched Takeshi, like, I was a fan of him. I saw him live at 2019, and uh, one of my mates at the time went, God damn, he's sexy. And I was like, <laughs> so I was sitting next to him, I was just like, Hey, you, you're all right, calm down, mate. But, yeah, he is, isn't he? But uh, it, when it, well, those type of matches are happening, like, I just kind of like remain uh, for my training what I did in Japan because with that, it's, it's endurance space. You have to keep your timing right, you have to keep your energy levels down. Like not get too freaked out in those moments because like there's a lot of like heavy shots. So the moment you start freaking out and breathing heavy and like not uh, not uh, creating space from your opponent, that's when you're gonna find yourself in like difficult positions. Bless you. Uh, but for me, like it, it's not a, a rodeo. Uh, it's not a ride that I haven't ridden before. Uh, I'm very much aware of like my. Um, I think my benefit throughout a lot of these guys is um, my my gas is kind of good, uh, uh, my breathing, my, my cardio, that's what I can't even think. You see, he did a lot of brain damage there, boom, like my... <laughs>
And granted, the story was Goto was trying to win the match for his father who passed away, so there was the emotional aspect and he's there. A New Japan Cup legend. You well, could say sure. If you wanted to gold watch him, you could. There were there were ways you could feed into that story. Absolutely. But man, oh man, he beat. And you know what? Yoda Suji, at this point in his career, young man, winning that New Japan Cup, getting a victory over a stalwart like Goto. That's a big deal. Should be a big deal. The people now, love they, the guy. Yeah. He's Look, got great size. He works that, fine enough. You know, it was yes. good. It was a very good match. He's got a great smile. The, beautiful <laughs> eyes. It's, his it's flowing the good, locks. The good DNA. It's why he's the Gene like, Blast. Good Lord, look at this man. Yeah, terrible nickname, Gene Blast. Oh. Now, you know, if, it is, if this is truly Naito's final run with the title, which I guess I shouldn't say that, but... It should be, it, probably. It could be. Let's be real. I mean, it, that's real. a quick end of the thing, but you know what? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. I could argue, okay, I could argue that it's not Naito's time yet to lose, but I could also argue that it doesn't matter. It's Suji's time to win. And that that trumps that trumps not Naito's time. We'll see what happens. But um, see there, what your boy's battle plan is old Gato there. There is because well, I uh, want to mention also that there is also the the possibility that this this could be uh, Moxley winning the title. No, uh, that, that is not out of the question. Do you doesn't understand? Help anybody? It's not out of the question. Doesn't help anybody. Well, I didn't say that. It's just it's not out of the question. Like uh, this could happen. Doesn't make any sense to me at all. And then you go ahead, you break up Naito's win, you have him go over Suji and Moxley's the champion, and then you have what? The only story I guess you can tell from there is some sort of, we have lost control of this company, and now we need our young guys to somehow band together out of their individual groups and fight against the, the gaijin that keep beating us. You know, it was Jay White, it was Will Ospreay, we go all the way back to Prince Devitt, Finn Balor, we, you know, we need to have our guys stand up for the future. That's the only way that storyline works. Suji still has to break up with Naito. At some point, that's got to happen. So that's why I think he doesn't win the title here because we're still going to have the breakup of LIJ or some sort of split in LIJ, which gets Suji out of there. And I think that's what you have to do or gets Naito out of there, however you want to do it, and you can make Shingo the leader. Fine, whatever. That's why I can see this storyline playing out for longer. Yoda Suji, though, is the future. He really, really is. And that's no offense to Shooter or anybody else that they have there. He's the one that the fans respond to the most. He's the one when all that House of Torture nonsense goes on, a lot of people will sit there and sit on their hands. He's the one in his matches, he gets the most reaction to try to fight all those guys off. He's the chosen one by the fans, much like Will Ospreay in AEW right now. Let's see how they play it. But the idea of Naito losing to Moxley is insane to me. It really, really is. Well, I, I would not say it's insane, but I mean, listen, if, if What's Moxley... What's the benefit for New Japan, though? Well, if, look... if Moxley wins a title, at some point he has to lose it. And I don't know what they're thinking. Maybe they're thinking, man, Yoda Suji beating Moxley for the title? Do that. But I don't know what they're but thinking. Brian, I don't even know if they're going to put the title on the guy. But here's the thing. If you're going to do that, then uh, to me, it's beat Naito because now it proves you are the man in Japan and then go on and beat Moxley at Windy City or beat both of them in a three-way. To me, that's more effective to continue Suji's run up than you know, beating Moxley again, you're still going to have to go over. I think in New Japan fans' minds, he's still going to have to go over a Naito, and you know all the, the well, other guys uh, hold that they on. have there. I, I I don't know if this is what you're saying, but I believe you're saying what if if Suji wins, it's not Suji and Moxley at Windy City. I mean, for sure, no matter what happens, they're doing no. Moxley and Naito. But you have the excuse to then do a three-way, put Suji in there, kind of put him on American soil for the first time to a, you know, a reaction on WrestleMania weekend or whatever the weekend that is. You pull that off. To me, that would be a much bigger deal and I think would do much more than, you know, almost anything else. Again, you have an IWGP three-way title match. I don't think people are going to be upset that they didn't get a one-on-one -on -one with Moxley and Naito if the champion Suji is there. Well, here's my argument, and that is that if they had not announced a card for Windy City, I could do them see them doing a three-way. But the fact that they announced a one-on-one -on -one singles match 
I don't think they're changing that main they event. Ver- yes, you're right. They very rarely vary from that, which is, again, what is making people believe that Naito is just going to go ahead and beat Suji, which is, again, you know, I, I don't know. Obviously, Suji's going to be okay, even if he loses here. But how they go about doing this is going to be interesting to see if Naito does anything heelish. Also on that show, we've got Hiromu and Ali. This is Windy City Riot. Ishii really and good. Nick Nemeth. Jack Perry and Shooter. We've got Hikaleo and El Fantasmo facing three other unnamed teams. Unnamed at this point. And we have Eddie Kingston and three partners versus Gabe Kidd and three partners. Which my guess would be Gabe pins Eddie to set up Eddie versus Gabe for the New Japan Strong Openweight title, which I could actually see Gabe Kidd taking back to New Japan. I think that would be a great idea. Man, poor Eddie. Great idea. Just dropping him one at a time. At least he had that triple crown for a while. Dude, it's time. That's the one thing. You know, that match was a really good match last night between the two of them, and I, you know, I've said it, been on record, I'm a huge Eddie Kingston fan both in and out of the ring, but... To me, losing these belts, and I'm not, no offense, Eddie, it's time to maybe go back to the Yonkers fit and not so much of the dangerous K, Kawada, black and yellow fit. I would like to see him maybe lose these belts and kind of jettison some of the Royal Road that he's had in his wrestling matches and kind of go back a little bit to the more raw guy that he was. Drop the honor bit a little bit. This would be a great excuse for him to, to get back into the mud again by losing these three belts. Should mention that uh, NXT did 569,000 viewers and a point eighteen. The demo was really good. They had uh, more young viewers than uh, I don't even remember. So uh, <laughs> it was a long time. They've, they've been having some rough roads here. And even look, that overall number is not spectacular. That's for sure. But I will tell you uh, two good things about WWE ratings over the last few days. Set. And that is that who's the guy they're going to build this company around after WrestleMania? Solo Sokoa. Cody Rhodes, come on. Oh. <laughs> and who's who's the, the biggest star that they're pushing in NXT? Trick Williams. Trick Williams. Yeah. Well, it's working because... Yeah. Well, that's true. That, that raw quarter with Cody Rhodes... Oh my God! It looked like it looked like one of those heartbeat things where it's like going like this and it goes chunk, and then it goes like that. Two million viewers for that Cody Rhodes segment that he did with Paul Heyman, and uh, like nothing else on the show came close. He just that when thing. When's the last time? Is that their highest peak in a long time? It feels like it. I I think it is. I guess it's the but, Rock, probably. I man, guess. that thing just shot up in the air when he came out, <laughs> and it was the same thing. NXT, you know, granted it was it was the overrun, and the overrun usually goes up, but uh, that overrun for that Trick Williams match that went way up. And the only here's the thing with this this Trick deal that I noticed when I was watching the match. Uh, the thing is, people right now, I don't think they should bring him up to the main roster, but they may. But the thing with Trick right now is people are super into Trick and Carmelo. But if you take Carmelo out of the equation, like they need something for Trick to really sink his teeth into because, you know, he did that match, you know, the the main event with Noam Dar, and it was like they were into it, but they didn't care that much. You know, it was just like a normal match. You know, Noam gets some heat and Trick makes a comeback. But what they really got into was when they did the angle and the promo and he talked about Carmelo. So hopefully they can shift that once this Carmelo feud is over and keep his momentum going because, you know, right now that's what people want to see is him and Carmelo. So well, Fans also, though, need to react to moves. And I saw that a little bit last night during Swerve's match with Butcher where it's like some of these moves that he's hitting probably should get more reaction and – you know, you got to be in if you're trying to get this guy over and people in NXT try to get their favorites over. Sometimes, you know, you got to react more to the good stuff that's going on in the ring. Back in a moment for some Dynamite and Rampage Observer Live. Thank you. 
Chico, I mean, excuse me, the twins. And then, yeah. Back of the show, Brian Alvarez here, Wrestling Observer Live. Mike Sempervivi, also of WrestlingObserver.com. So uh, this episode actually makes a good point here, which is, uh, it's semantics. But, uh, so Adam Copeland in the main event faced uh, Christian for the TNT title. And the match went long. It went past the top of the hour. And so, because of that, Samuel here says, Copeland winning the TNT title was technically the first ever AEW title change ever on Rampage. So there you go. Oh, how about it? Yeah. Now, will Nielsen look at it that way? Uh, I don't know how they're going to look at it. So, uh... You know where it uh, uh it's so you'll, you'll never guess by the way my uh my you know uh YouTube TV cut off the Well end I was rampage. just about to bring this and up And it was I... not just me. I heard so many people <laughs> that did not get to see the end of Rampage because their sling or their this or their that cut it off. I've tried everybody. I mean I've tried. I was not watching live as usual, so I have it set for the DVR and you could tell because in the morning what happens i guess automatically is it will fix whatever time you need and and save the show in its entirety that's why i was baffled at first when brian was complaining but when you're watching live like that it doesn't reset itself so by the time he's got to do observer radio he's screwed i never have that issue so today i'm watching and there was a distinct cut 
right when Edge or right when Adam Copeland hit Christian in the cojones with the nail piece of nail board that he had and that's where it looked like it had cut out right there and then kicked in again so is that where it stopped for you no i didn't get the end of a rampage oh i didn't get the end of the street fight okay well were you watching any issue with dynamite at all at least well no because because i i it records rampage and so i saw the overrun on rampage (laughs) but uh you know i I thought two street fights on the same night by the way I don't know, but well, one was technically an I quit match. I guess so. So, uh, I mean, the one thing I'll say is is uh, this was this was really, and it was kind of weird. So, I thought that Dynamite was uh, quite great. Really liked the show. Good. And uh, the two hours ended, and I don't know what it was, but like they started that Rampage show, and it was just like a totally different show, and it felt so long. The ten minute, what felt like. Acclaimed promo to start it did not help matters, I don't believe. No, and it's like, you know, what I've mentioned this before, Dynamite is the one show I watch where I will always at some point check to see, my God, how much time has passed, okay? And Raw is actually the worst offender. Like, sometimes I feel like it's got to have been an hour, and it's only been about 39 minutes. Like, oh, my God. SmackDown is usually exactly as long as it is, and then... Dynamite is the one where I'll be like, it's probably been close to an hour, and I hit the thing, and it's an hour and 15 minutes. The show flies by quicker. That did not happen with Rampage. That show felt like it was another two hours. And, you know, I liked I liked the Hobbs and Fletcher versus Orange and Trent match. And, you know, Takeshita and Rocky Romero, that was a good match. And Willow Nightingale and Chris Statlander versus Julian Sky Blue in a street fight. I mean, that was a really good street fight. But it just, three hours is too long to watch a show. It's just too long, especially a television show. Pay-per-view can be different, but that was a long night. You know, Brandon Thurston, I saw a tweet from him yesterday, and I'm I'm not going to be able to, to quote it, but basically, you know, if you had to have, if you're looking at this from a executive at TNT's and TBS's point of view, would you rather have a three-hour show on Wednesday as opposed to a three-hour show and then a Friday show that is not getting any eyeballs and just kind of Well, we don't know how many eyeballs this has gotten yet. We'll, we'll know at the end of the day. That's that's true, and that's one of the things he was pointing out because if this is somehow more successful or at least on par with what they do on Friday nights, is that a possibility? Now, I would hope that would be... No, dear God, no, but money talks in this case. That's what drove Raw to it in the first place. Well, there's also um, there's also this aspect, which I don't know how they would view it. I don't know what the show after Dynamite does. But if Dynamite actually moved to three hours, then it's exactly like what happened with, uh, with Raw and also WCW. Let's just say for uh, uh, the, the purposes of easy math, Let's just say that the first hour of Dynamite does 800,000, and the second hour does 800,000. Well, the show does 800,000 viewers. Okay? That's what you list on the on the whatever. Well, if you do three hours, and the first hour does 800,000, and the second hour does 800,000, and we'll just say the third hour does 500,000, and then you, uh, that ends up being, overall, you did 700,000. You actually did worse. Then you did two hours. And uh, I don't know. All I know is this, okay? When Raw moved to three hours, like, they cratered their audience for a good, I don't know how long it was. They started in 2012, right? And then they cratered the audience through about, I don't know, 2020 or so. I mean, it was just declined. And now they've just now started to regain some of that audience because, like, the product is on fire. So I don't recommend anybody do three hours, ever. That is my recommendation. Unless the, the, the place comes to you and they go, we're going to give you uh, $200 million for two hours, or we'll give you uh, $300 million for three hours. All right, I'll do three hours. No problem. You got it. But I don't know what they're going to do. And that's exactly what it would take to do it. So we had a Mercedes interview, which uh, I don't know. 
you know, the video should have been a cold opening and then had her talk about it, her throwing it to it. I know it was, that's where somebody's going to go. The show was way too much like WWE last night. I disagree. I thought it was a, a good show throughout, and I thought it was a nice blend of everything. But with that said, that video should probably have cold opened the show, then have her come out, cut that promo, because breaking it up like that, I think, dragged it out. And again, I, you know, let's see how much momentum she can continue to have. But it's going to be interesting to see if people, if there is going to be anybody that boos her or anything like that. Sasha's a great heel. You know, and I know I guess she doesn't want to be, and, and certainly introducing her, you want her to be a hero right now, but... It's going to be interesting to see how things go because, again, with Willow, if you're going to match those two up against each other and choose sides, I think a lot of people are going to end up choosing Willow. Well, she did a promo. She did a lot of smiling and holding her heart. And uh, and then... Raw rolls on? Say it. Well, they didn't say Raw rolls on. I'm surprised they didn't. <laughs> but then they did a deal where they had a schmoz. Julie and Sky Blue hit the ring, and then out come Willow and Statlander, and the heels bail. And then Willow teases hitting Mercedes with the chair, but she she drops it. And Mercedes cuts a promo on her and leaves. And then later they had a segment where Willow and Statlander and Stokely are doing an interview, and Mercedes walks up, and she's all friendly with Statlander, and she's nice and everything like this. And then she goes to leave, and, and Willow wants to say hi. But Mercedes just cuts her off and gets in her face and says, you've done enough, and storms off. Totally heelish. And, you know, if you've been watching the show, which I have, Willow is the most over female baby face they have. She's the most beloved female baby face they have. And Mercedes is supposed to be a baby face, and apparently they're going to be feuding. And I don't know if they're going to turn on one or the other or what they're going to do. But, uh, yes, Mercedes is way better served as a heel. She's much better as a heel than as a baby face. And, you know, one of the things with her, to me, as a baby face, is she always comes off heelish, even as a baby face. Yeah. So I think long term she needs to be a heel, but I don't think it's happening soon. It'll be interesting to see the crowds, what they choose to do for Mercedes and Willow. And that's if they go in that direction. They can have a match that doesn't necessarily turn one of them, especially because I think at the end of the day, Statlander is going to be the one that turns on Willow. And then, yes. of course, that goes, you say, what What are you going to do with Mercedes after that? Well, you know, there's other women that you have options with. So I think aligning Willow and Mercedes long term for both of them is going to be beneficial. Then we had uh, Jericho and Hook. And this was, in fact, the polar opposite of the House of Black versus the Infantry. Both of the matches were about putting over the young star. And the House of Black could not have made these guys look like bigger geeks. And Jericho could not have done more to try to make Hook look like a top-tier future main eventer. He just... Sold and sold and sold and sold and sold and then got pinned clean in the middle and then afterwards endorsed the guy, put him over, and he's got a he's got a forget what he said. I've got a proposition for you or something on, on dynamite. Yeah. But two totally, totally <laughs> different Jericho took one hell of an ass kicking yesterday you don't say absolutely dude dropped on his neck on his shoulder on his head he was just getting even during picture in picture he was getting thrown around and then laying there like a heap because they kept it on a wide shot it was it was something else the only thing he could have done more is actually tap out to the choke instead of getting that little hope spot at the end that nobody wanted to see anyway but it does leave the door open for later him actually doing that because who knows what this proposition is actually going to be and who knows what happens with Jericho. So that was, uh, that was good. And then, uh, we had a lot of good interviews, everything setting up the big matches. And then of course the main event was the I quit match. And I had mixed feelings about this match. Cause like they were great. Like they had a great, great match, but then at the end it was just like, 
And I, I, you know, I'm sure Adam books all of this stuff. And this was a WWE 40-year blow-off match finish where you get everybody involved in there, you know, everybody else runs in, you handcuff everybody to the ropes, the heel female manager runs away. I mean, it was it was like four-on-one heels or baby faces versus the one heel. And then they hit him with everything in the book, including a board covered in nails to the ding-dong, which, by the way, Christian did not quit after that. Which raises a lot of questions. Well, <laughs> And then when Adam went to hit him in the head with it, then he, then he gave up. But, like, I mean, the work itself was great. I thought both guys were great. But I did think the, the finish was just, like, well, total overkill. I get it. Total Look, overkill. You, you play off the Magnum Tully thing where he's going to lodge it in Tully's eye and then... You know, he he doesn't do it, you know, and, and Tully says, I quit. So I get that. Plus, I think for posterity's sake, even though everybody's going to remember that boot to the cojones there with the with the nail board, I don't know if that's how you want that finish to be. I, I don't know. I could see them not wanting that. I probably would have just left it that way, but I could see them for later on just wanting to have Christian say, I quit with that thing held over his head. And I'll talk more about this tonight, but... I love Rocky. He's our guy. Too much O. But, man, he did not need to give Takeshita such a beating <laughs> last night. Because, literally, next week, they didn't bill it as such, but Don Cal's pretty much said so. You know, it's Swerve and Takeshita in a number one contenders match. Takeshita should have smashed somebody on this show. Swerve did, but he gave Rocky everything before finally beating him. Back in a moment with more Observer Live. Keith Elliott Greenberg with Inside the Ropes magazine. What's up, Keith? This is a very historic night tonight, and there were a number of legends in the arena. Uh, were you able at some point to slow down enough to glean any knowledge or at least inspiration from those legends? So this honestly is, I hope I'm allowed to say it, but like, so I, I was like, ah, ah, backstage, the doctors were like, all right, on the table, we'll just put some ice on your butt, and like, I was like laying on the table. Uh, and then like Ric Flair walked in and I was like, oh, and stood up and, I was like, yes. and he was just, and he said, uh, you are everything I've heard of and more. You are one of the best wrestlers in the world. And that coming from him is just like, thank you, Mr. Ric Flair. Thank you very much. Cause he's a standard. Like, I, I know, like, I, I know sometimes I like, get forgotten about, but like every like little bit of wrestling has some like inspiration from Ric Flair, man. So like, the fact that he was able to like just come over and just go like, you're the fucking man. It's like, man, amazing, like brilliant stuff. I'm a bit of a two-parter. Uh, Tony, you were present for a pretty crazy match that Will had a couple weeks ago. I'm interested to hear like what goes through your mind when somebody who you've already invested in is having a, a, a match like that, which is incredible, but also uh, risky and Will. When we had spoke prior, you, you communicated how important it was for you to still be able to live in the UK. Uh, how important was that to coming here, and, and what kind of schedule will you be on moving forward? Well, I, I was a tremendous match. That was an amazing, amazing, amazing match for Will to finish up in Rev Pro. And after a great run in New Japan Rev Pro, I thought Will versus Michael Oku was a great match. And I was really blown away, not only by the quality of the wrestling, but also... Uh, really the quality of people. I got to meet Will Ospreay's family for the first time, which was really cool. Was the, so sweet, dude. You're the man. And uh, the, the great things he said afterwards, it was just really kind. And uh, I thought the way he helped uh, really set up his debut in AEW and also paid tribute to the great fans in the UK that helped him get to this place. It was really a great thing, and it was great to be there. And, of course... The match took a big toll, I think, physically, but knowing it's Will Ospreay, you know, I had a high confidence he was going to be here, be ready for Revolution, and uh, he was everything we would have expected. The match was everything we would have expected. I thought Ospreay versus Takeshi had delivered, Revolution delivered, and again, I think Will Ospreay in AEW fits like a glove, as you're seeing here tonight uh, firsthand. Thank you, Sean. I'm basically Wolverine, bro, but I'll be fine in like a couple of days. Just heal up.
ready to get out of here for the week or what? I'm ready to go have lunch. Oh, my God. Yes. <laughs> and just think you got filthy Tom. I was going to say, I can't get out of here. I got to come back for Tom. <laughs> And after dealing with those kids, you got to deal with your own kids, for heaven's sake. I realize it was six days ago, but a lot of people want that darn SmackDown review. <laughs> so we're going to give it to you this afternoon. God bless. As well as uh, the New Japan Cup. We'll talk about that. Stardom? And uh, I think Tom's going to talk about stardom. I have not uh, seen any of the stardom show, but he has. Cinderella? And also uh, the UFC lawsuit. So we had lots to talk about. Only for subscribers, WrestlingObserver.com. Or video.f4wonline.com. And then tonight, the Brian and Vinny show will have uh, 90 minutes on the uh, AW and NXT. You know what's good? It's, uh, I thought I thought both were very good shows this week. Yes, yeah. even NXT. It had had a rough stretch there. I thought, I thought it was a much better show than usual this week. So we'll talk all about that tonight. Brian and Vinny show, WrestlingObserver.com, video.f4wonline.com. And uh, then tomorrow's all yours. You and Tom can talk about whatever you want. Keep me out of it. I don't know if he's going to be around. I think he may be in Cleveland for the AIW show. But can you imagine this on a poster, too, right there, front and center? Filthy Tom Lawler, Effie, and Demolition. What? To me, that's my dream Survivor Series team. Now, they're not all facing each other, but the fact they're all going to be in one location that's pretty amazing. I think that's going to be on Triller TV for those of you with subscriptions. Well, we'll have more tonight, everybody. It's going to be a lot of fun, so check it out. And uh, that's it. Thanks, Mike, as always. Callers and listeners, everybody in the studio. I'll talk to some of you, 2 Pacific, 5 Eastern with Tom, Wrestling Observer Live.